Okay, welcome to our last video lecture. Hopefully you are listening to this lecture and watching it at the same time. Um, and if you're not, you won't have heard me say that. Uh, so I just want to review where we are with rotational motion um, and uh, go through uh, some uh, kinematics, kinetic energy, and moment of inertia. Uh, we're not going to do torque. We can wait on that. Um, so to start with, we've got kinematics. Remember, we what's here is just is completely summarized, nothing new. We've got the translational variables x, v, and a, which have the equivalent rotational variables theta, omega, and alpha, and the equivalent three kinematic equations. And these describe um, a point mass moving for translation in a straight line. That's one dimensional translational motion, one dimensional kinematics. Um, we obviously can do three dimensions by just changing x to y and putting subscripts on v and a of y, x, y, or z. Um, and rotational, we're just doing one-dimensional rotational kinematics, um, and this refers to a point mass going in a circle uh, at a distance r from some pivot point. Some piv I didn't have put the p for pivot point, but some pivot point. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so what? Uh, so let's just look at this point mass moving in a circle. Uh, I've just chosen one uh, one segment of that circle where the point mass moves through an angle theta, and it moves along a, a arc length s at a radius r from the pivot point. Again, p for pivot point. That's a p for pivot point. Um, and we know that s equals r theta, where theta is in radians. Okay, so we already said that. Um, so the distance. Distance, S is a distance, not a displacement, because displacement has to be a straight line distance. S is a distance uh, equals R theta. Now, what I want to do is take the time, der time derivative of uh, S equals R theta. In other words, take the derivative with respect to time of both sides and recognize that S will change, can change with time because we can go farther and farther around the circle. Um, and theta will change with time, but R is a constant. So R... Uh, that you can't, I'm sorry, the derivative of a constant, you just pull that constant out front, and so what you get is ds dt equals r d theta dt, because r is a constant. And we can recognize that ds dt is the speed, it's the speed of the object that is moving in the circle. The tangential velocity, or the speed in the tangential direction, um, the, the direction is forwards, so I guess it's the speed of the object um, in the tangential direction. Uh, and so the relationship, I didn't mean to cross that out with that yellow circle, um, the relationship between the tangential speed, which is a translational variable, and the angular speed is V equals R omega. We can and I, I want to look a, a little more at this relationship, right? Let's take our, our object moving in a circle. It's always got a velocity which points in a forward direction. It's tangential to the circle with a magnitude of r omega. And let's look at this picture in the lower left-hand corner and recognize that it's also got a, in a component of acceleration pointing towards the center of the circle called the centripetal acceleration. We know that. That's nothing new, the inward acceleration, which we know we've determined before is v squared over r, speed squared over r. If speed changes, certainly the centripetal acceleration changes, right? It's still v squared over r. If v is smaller, then centripetal acceleration is smaller. If v is larger, centripetal acceleration is larger. But think about what if v changes, right? This We had done this so far for just... Um, uh, uniform circular motion, but what if, uh, if, if V changes, well, then we're going to have an additional acceleration, right? The inward acceleration, remember, is due to just the fact that we're changing angle, but what if speed changes as well? Well, so, oh, that's what I say here. What if speed changes as well? Um, the fact that we're going in a circle is what gives us V squared over R if V is constant, but if V changes, the centripetal acceleration changes, but we also get another acceleration, right? I can take the derivative again of both sides, take the time derivative, uh, and we get dv dt, r is a constant, so that's doesn't, nothing happens there, equals r d omega over dt, d omega dt. So the question is, is what is this dv dt? It's not the centripetal acceleration. The centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. 
So what is this dvdt? It's a different acceleration, right? So remember, now let's just remember that, whoops, let me go back. Then on the right-hand side, when we took the derivative of V equals R omega, we got um, on the right-hand side R d omega dt. And let me ask first, what's d omega dt? Well, d omega dt is just the angular acceleration, right? And what does the angular acceleration mean? Angular acceleration means that it's slowing down or speeding up as it goes in the circle. Right? It's covering less or more angle per unit time, right? The omega is changing. And so that is angular acceleration, right, on the right-hand side. But again, we're asking, so what is this dv dt on the left-hand side? The dv dt on the left-hand side is an acceleration. It's the acceleration in what direction? It's the acceleration in the direction of motion. So remember that there is a centripetal acceleration towards the center, but there it can also be if the speed changes, right? And that centripetal acceleration, the one towards the center of motion, is dependent on the fact that it's going in a circle, that the angle is changing. But if the speed is changing, then there can also be a, a, an acceleration in the direction of motion, and this dv dt is that acceleration in the direction of motion, which is called the acceleration in the tangential direction, or just a sub tan or a sub t, the tangential direction. So we've got, in this picture, you can see that there's two accelerations, one towards the center, v squared over r, and one uh, tangential, which is dv dt. So what that equation that we were taking the time derivative of tells us is that the tangential acceleration is r alpha. The acceleration in the forward direction is r alpha. So there's two components. Just don't, don't get confused, right? All we're saying is that there's two components of acceleration. If the speed is constant, there's only one component it's towards the center. If the speed is changing, then there's two components. Acceleration towards the center and acceleration tangential, right? They're perpendicular components. And the net acceleration is something, right, something in between. Okay. So... Now, the, now we've got these relationships between our translational and rotational variables. So, so we've, we wrote down our translational variables, we wrote down our rotational variables, we wrote down the equations that relate um, the variables, but, but these now are the, uh, are the equations that relate the translational to the rotational variables, right? We've got, um, these are all translational variables, and these are all, ro whoops, sorry, these are all rotational variables, v squared over r is still translational variables theta, omega, and alpha. All right, let's get rid of those circles. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so there's our relationships. Okay, so let's do an example. Let me ask, what is the angular acceleration for an automobile wheel, right? So here's my automobile wheel. There's another one here. This is my car, it's just hidden by the text. Um, right, so there's a car, there's a driver. All right, well, anyway. Um, Undo, 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 undo. Okay, so what is the angular acceleration of an automobile wheel when the car slows down from 30 meters per second to zero meters per second in four seconds? Let's assume that the radius, I, I just looked up the typical radius of a car wheel. I think this might be actually a little large, but radius is 30 centimeters. I didn't mean to make these both 30s, but anyway. Um, so what's the angular acceleration of the wheel when the car slows in the forward direction from 30 meters per second to zero? Something to recognize here, really important point. If the car is rolling without slipping, in other words, it's not skidding down the road, the wheels are stuck to the road, they're rolling without slipping, a point on the edge of the tire, a point on the edge, whoops, oh man, a point on the, oh, sorry, this is, touchpad is acting weird. A point on the edge of the tire which goes around the tire, that point must move at the, in, at the same distance and speed as the car. Because it, it's in contact with the road, it's not sliding relative to the road, it must move the same distance as the car moves. It must move the same speed, therefore, as the car moves, and it must move at the same tangential acceleration as the car moves. The acceleration of that point, which is the tangential acceleration, must be the same acceleration as the car. So that's a really important point. If the car is slipping, then, that's, then that, all bets are off, right? Imagine, for example, the wheels are spinning, but we're on ice, and the car isn't actually going forward at all. So the forward speed has nothing to do with the wheel speed. It's only if the car isn't slipping that the forward speed has to do with the same, is the same speed as a point at the edge of the wheel. Okay. So a point at the edge of the wheel has the same speed as the, the speed of the car moving forwards, if it's not slipping. 
if it's not slipping. And that means that the uh, acceleration of that point, the acceleration in the tangential direction, must be the same as the acceleration of the car in the forward direction. Um, as long as it's not slipping, right? That's, I keep saying that. As long as it's stuck to the road. And also, just from definition, from the definition, we know that the uh, tangential acceleration also are, are alpha. So we can now relate the forward acceleration of the car to the, acceler the uh, angular acceleration of the wheel by putting together these two equations. So the acceleration of the car is V final minus V initial over time. So the acceleration of the car is minus 7.5 meters per second. Um, and we can then relate that to our alpha. And so solve for alpha so that alpha is the tangential acceleration divided by the radius of the wheel, right? This was the radius given. And so we get the tangential acceleration is minus 2.5. Look at my units. I had meters per second squared for tangential acceleration. I've got meters for radius. And so the units end up being one over second squared. I'll come back to that in a second. We have a minus sign, minus 2.5, uh, minus 2.5 units of one over second squared, or one over, or, or hertz squared. But, okay, first thing is the sign. Notice we got a negative sign. Well, we got a negative sign because we had defined the positive direction. Without you knowing it, we had defined the positive direction. Because I told you that it was, uh, it was moving forward at plus 30 meters per second to plus zero meters per second, we are implying that the forward direction is positive. If we're implying the forward direction is positive, then we must be consistent about the wheels. If the car is moving forward, notice that the wheel is spinning in the direction that I show. The wheel is spinning in that direction, so that must also be the positive direction of rotation. So clockwise must be the positive direction of rotation. That's the direction that a point on the wheel is, is moving, the direction of the velocity, a speed of the wheel is moving in the clockwise direction. So we've defined the plus direction for you. And so the fact that the acceleration, the angular acceleration is negative means that the wheel is slowing down in the positive direction. It means the angular acceleration is in that direction. It's in the negative direction. So the angular acceleration should indeed be negative. That works out just right. Now, what about the units of angular acceleration? Remember that the units of angular acceleration are actually radians per second squared. But remember, radian is a unitless quantity, and the fact that, that the angular acceleration, look here, this middle uh, equation, well, it's not really middle, but anyway, um, it's the ratio of two quantities, which came from S equals R theta. Remember, we started with S equals R theta, where theta is in radians. It's a ratio of two, um, of two distances, where theta is in radians. So this must also be radians. So the, the correct units are indeed one over second squared. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is radians per second squared. It's minus 2.5 radians per second squared. That really tells us what, what the units are better than one over second squared. I know it's, it's a little weird, but both are correct units, um, but it is indeed measuring the amount of radians that are changing per second squared. Okay. That's all I got for kinematics. We're going to move back to kinetic energy, which we were doing in class today. Here's kinetic energy. Kinetic energy total, we said, we said, oh, wait, if something's rotating, there must be more energy in the object if it's going, it's, if it's going forward than if it wasn't rotating, because there's more motion, and kinetic energy is the energy due to movement. And the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy of a body is indeed its kinetic energy of a center of mass plus the kinetic energy of rotation about that center of mass. So the kinetic energy of the center of mass, we, we, we know is one half mb squared. And we said, so rotational kinetic energy, m has a, an equivalent, which is i. V has an equivalent, which is omega. And so we've got rotational kinetic energy, which is one half i omega squared. But I want you to notice that, like, so nothing's changed. This is just the total kinetic energy. Before, when we talked about the total kinetic energy, total was whatever the total was. Um, you know, when we said work, total equals change in kinetic energy, we meant the total kinetic energy, but up until now, nothing rotated because we've only dealt with point masses. Point masses can't rotate. There's no mass extending beyond the pivot point to rotate. Um, so, so when we talked about something just having kinetic energy one half mb squared, we assumed nothing was rotating. Even when we said a car is moving forward, 
at a velocity of 30 meters per second, we didn't, we, we didn't think about the fact that it had rotating wheels, but not only that, it has more rotating parts in it than just wheels, so it's got more kinetic energy that we're not accounting for. So up until now, nothing rotated. Now we're going to account for the fact that things rotate, so we've got the total kinetic energy is slight, slightly more complicated. Okay, so let's do an example. A car is driving at 30 meters per second. We'll just take the same car we're dealing with in the last problem. The mass of the car is 2,000 kilograms. What's the kinetic energy of that car? So this is a traditional, treating it like a point mass. What's the kinetic energy of that car? Then we say, okay, but actually we're underestimating the kinetic energy because the wheels are also rotating. So what's the uh, percent difference? By what percent difference are we, or by what percentage are we underestimating the energy of the car by not taking into account the wheel rotation? So we have to give some stats for the wheels, right? Let's say that the mass of the wheel is 10 kilograms and the radius of the wheel is 0.3 meters. Okay. And then the, the last question is, is there any other mechanical energy we're not taking into account when we talk about, when we treat a car like a point mass? We're certainly not taking into account the fact the wheels are rotating. Is there anything else rotating in the car? Okay. Let's first do part A. Part A, easy, 1 half mv squared, plug in, we get 9 times 10 to the fifth joules. 9 times 10 to the fifth joules, treating the car like a point mass. But then we say, oh, but wait, the wheels are rotating, so let's take into account the kinetic energy of a rotating wheel. By the way, this amount, 9 times 10 to the fifth joules, takes into account the center of mass movement of the wheels going forward because the mass, this mass, the 2,000 kilograms, is the total mass of the car, including the wheels. So we've already taken into account the center of mass uh, movement of the wheels and the rest of the car. But let's just say only the wheels are rotating, so what's the kinetic energy due to rotation of a wheel? Kinetic energy due to rotation of a wheel is 1 half i omega squared, and we just plug into that. We just plug into that. But wait, what is i and what is omega? Well, we haven't really talked about that. So, so we need to plug in, figure out what those are and then plug into this, uh, plug into this expression. Okay, so, what is an, so first of all, what is the moment of inertia? Of a wheel. Well, I'll tell you, actually, um, this is something that you can just look up in the chapter. You can just look it up in the book. We don't have to worry too much about it. We'll talk later a little bit more about moment of inertia, but look it up in the book. And what you find is that the moment of inertia of a solid wheel, this is a solid wheel, as opposed to like a bicycle wheel that has spokes and it's mostly uh, mass at its edge. A moment of inertia of a solid wheel is one half mr squared. That it, and that's for a wheel rotating about its center. And these wheels are, you know, their pivot points are their centers. So we'll talk more about other things, like if it's not a solid wheel or if it's not rotating around its center, et cetera, later. But we can just look it up. Say that's the moment of inertia of a wheel, one half mr squared. Okay, so the moment of inertia of the wheel, which is one half mr squared, is 0.45 in mks units. m was 10, r was 0.3 in mks units. And what are the units of the moment of inertia? We've got kilograms meters squared. So kilograms times meters squared. Yes, that's a kilograms times meters squared. It's the way we write it. It's not minus, it's a multiplication. Um, so the, the units of moment of inertia is kilogram meters squared. Units of mass is kilogram. Unit of moment of inertia is kilogram meters squared. Okay, the other question is, before we move on, is the moment of inertia a vector? Moment of inertia is the equivalent of mass Mass is not a vector, it's a scalar. Moment of inertia is not a vector, it's not a scalar. It's not a scalar. Sorry, did I just say that right? It is, it is a scalar. It's not a vector, it's a scalar. Moment of inertia is a scalar. Okay, so we can go ahead and ask, okay, back to um, what is the kinetic energy of the rotating wheel? Uh, oh, well, we figured out I is 0.45 kilogram meter squared, but what is omega? Well, we got to go back to the fact that if the car is rolling and not slipping, then the omega of the wheel, the rotational velocity of the wheel, is related to the forward velocity of the wheel by omega equals v over r. If it's rolling without slipping, those two have the relationship shown. Omega equals v over r. Okay, so omega is v over r, 30 meters per second in the forward direction, divided by a radius of 0.3 meters, gives us the omega as 100 radians per second. The units, again, work out the same as before. It actually gives you 100, uh, and the units being 1 over seconds, but we know because of this ratio that we're taking 
um, and it comes from S equals R theta, that this is actually radians per second. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and plug in 100 radians per second and 0.45 kilograms meter squared into kinetic energy of rotation. And so what we end up getting is that the kinetic energy of rotation per wheel, the kinetic energy of rotation is 2,250 joules. Yes, there are four wheels on most cars. So that would be a total kinetic energy of rotation of four wheels times that. So there you go. The total kinetic energy of the car is 9 times 10 to the fifth joules. That's the center of mass translational kinetic energy. Here's the rotational kinetic energy with four wheels. Notice that it's 9.09 .09 times 10 to the fifth joules, which is a 1% difference without the wheels. Right? It was 9 or 9.09. .09. That's a 1% difference. So the wheels don't add a whole lot of kinetic energy, but they add enough. But they don't add a whole lot. Okay, so then the last question was... Um, and that says listen, meaning that I'm not going to write it down. Hopefully, you, know, you better be listening. Um, that uh, that um, is there anything else in the car that's adding mechanical energy that we don't take into account when we treat the car as a point mass just moving uh, forward, right? Are there other things rotating? There's the wheels that are rotating. Are there other things that create that, that add to the mechanical energy? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of things in a car that add to the mechanical energy because the wheels are not the only thing that's rotating. Um, there's uh, the, the axles are rotating. It's kind of hard for me to draw this. But anyway, the axles are rotating. And then there's that, uh, I always forget what it's called, the rod that moves down the middle of the car that the uh, pistons push on that rotates that ends up making the axles rotating. So there's actually a lot of things in a car that are moving relative to the center of mass, right? The center of mass is moving, but there are a lot of other things that are moving. So there's a fair amount of more 1% or more. Um, so, so there's actually a fair amount more energy, more kinetic energy. So the answer is more kinetic energy, um, or K, in, in the car than just the center of mass kinetic energy. I don't know how much more. I really don't. Whether it's 5% more, 10% more, there's more. And what does that mean? That means that in order to run your car, it takes more work because the work is equal to the kinetic, is changing kinetic energy, right? So that you get it up to a certain kinetic energy. You actually, ha you have to put all that work into moving everything, all the parts of the car. So it takes more work to move your car than just the center of mass kinetic energy, right? Here's the center of mass kinetic energy. Um, it takes more work than that to move your car. It takes this much work. Uh, to move your car with four wheels, but it takes even more when we add in all the rest of the working, working parts. Okay, that's that problem. Oh yeah, that's what I just said on the previous page. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is just say a little bit more about rotational inertia, then we'll be done. Oh wait, first, in the um, vein of the low temperature physics that I was talking about uh, today, here's a... Oh. Never mind. Uh, did you hear about the man who got cooled to absolute zero? He's okay now. I know, you don't get it. You have to write it out. He, whoops. He's okay now. That's zero Kelvin. Ha ha, cooled to absolute zero. Zero Kelvin. Oh gosh, never mind. Okay. Okay, so, moment of inertia. I don't know what jokes I've told you and what jokes I haven't now. There really aren't that many science jokes that I feel comfortable telling. Okay, anyway, um, a bit more about moment of inertia. This is the last part of the lecture. Um, we gotta define it and then do two examples. So a measure of how, remember moment of inertia is a measure of how hard it is to change a body's rotational motion, just like inertia, M, is a measure of how hard it is to change a body's linear motion. Definition of moment of inertia, here we go, right here. A point mass, m, at a distance r from the pivot point, like a ball on a string, the moment of inertia of a point mass is m r squared. Okay, that's definition. Definition. Three equal signs. Definition. Not negative, but three equal signs. Okay. Definition of moment of inertia. The equation definition. Okay. So that means that since moment of inertia is a scalar, if we have a collection of masses, right? So this is a collection of masses. This is a messy collection of masses. It looks like the lab. Um, like the lab is a mess if you've been there recently. Just masses all over the place. Um, each one, you know, M1, M2, M3, M4. They're at a radius R1, R2, R3, R4 from some pivot point. Let's imagine that we're spinning the whole lab around, 
just rotate, which we are, right? We're rotating around the center of the Earth, uh, not you know, the axis. Um, and so what's the moment of inertia of this collection of four masses? It's the sum of the moments of inertia of each of the individual masses. Because it's a scalar, we can just sum them up, and we can just write that shorthand as the sum of over i. i is just an index. Remember, it's not nothing to do with the moment of inertia. Sorry, the little i here is an index. It's not nothing to do with the moment of inertia. Big i is moment of inertia. Um, so we just sum up all the MR squareds. The one, sum up the first mass times its radius squared plus the second mass times its radius squared plus the third mass times its radius squared, etc. So that's how moment of inertia for a set of masses is defined. So if, if there's a set of point masses is the sum of MR squared, then we can take a solid mass. So let's now take our wheel, right, which is a solid mass, and you just break that up into little point masses. I just took three random ones, but right, you can break it up into a series of point masses and take the radius of each of those point masses from the pivot point. And so it's going to be the sum of each of those point masses, which I'm here calling dm, times their r squared. And if we make dm small enough, the sum turns into an integral. So we've got the integral of dm times r squared. For a continuous mass, which is broken into small points, each point has a mass of dm. We'll show you how that works in a second. But that's the moment of inertia of a continuous mass. That's how we calculate it. And that's how when you look it up in the book, you should look up the moment of inertia of a wheel, the moment of inertia of a disc, the moment of inertia of a ball, the moment of inertia of a meter stick. You can look all those up in the chapter. It gives you values. It, they've already done the integration for you. But we'll do one example. First, let's do an example with point masses. Let's take that dumbbell we were talking about in class today. The dumbbell, all that is, is two point masses which are distance L away from each other. Let's put some numbers to it. I know I chose two, the numbers are probably too round. But let's say each mass, each point mass is 10 kilograms. We're going to treat each of these as a point mass. Um, we don't have to. We can treat them as an extended mass, but let's just say this is two point masses separated by a distance L of one meter. And I want to ask, what is the moment of inertia of this dumbbell? What's the moment of inertia of the dumbbell? In other words, how hard it is to rotate it. How hard it is? How hard is it to rotate it? Now, keep in mind that we showed in class today that moment of inertia, how hard it is to rotate something, depends on the axis about which you rotate. So, for example, if I rotate this thing, ah, sometimes this won't let me draw points. Yeah, all right. If I rotate it about its center, its moment of inertia is different than if I, let's say, rotate it about one end. Ah, stop it. If I rotate it about one end, right? And so part A is what if I rotate it about its center? Part center. Part B is what if I rotate it about an end? When I say rotate about a center, right, let's just state center for, to start with. If I rotate it about the center, then it's going to rotate in a circle like this. Or if I rotate it about the end, that means that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom end. I know you can't tell, but the bottom end. Then the top end is going to rotate about the bottom end, right? And notice that that's going to be Actually, it should be harder to rotate because we've got more mass away from the center, right? It's going in a bigger circle. Um, so we're going to calculate what's the moment of inertia about the center and what's the moment of inertia about the end. Let's do the center first. About the center, let's put the, the axis, or really the pivot point, right at the center. We're going to rotate it about that. Um, and ask what's the moment of inertia about that point. Well, we have to measure the radius of each of the masses from that point. Each one is equidistant. Right? But moment of inertia is the sum of the MR squareds. When we go ahead and plug in, we're going to get the same thing for each term, right? So the, for mass 1, it's 10 kilograms times 0.5 meters squared. For mass 2, it's 10 kilograms times 0.5 meters squared. You add that all up, and the moment of inertia of this barbell about its center is 5 kilogram meters squared. What about about the end? Well, about the end, right, so here's my axis of rotation or pivot point, right? It's about this end. We're going to rotate it about that end. And so we draw the radius to each mass from the green. So just look, ignore the red, look at the green. Well, the first mass, which I've just totally scribbled over, is zero distance, right? Because it, it, we're treating it like a point mass. It's at the at pivot point. So it's got a zero distance, whereas the second one, r, is the full L, right? Is one meter. So for the first one, oh, well, I just reversed it. So for the first one, m1r1 r squared plus m2r2 squared, the sum 
of the two moments of inertia of the point masses. Well, the first one is a distance of one meter away, and the second one is a distance of zero meters away. So the moment of inertia of that is 10 kilogram meters per second squared, meters second squared. So what did I, what did I just say? There's no second. 10 kilogram meters squared. So notice the moment of inertia of the barbell about its end is greater than the moment of inertia of the barbell about its center. Okay, and that's always gonna be the case. If, if the mass is equally balanced about the pivot point, it's gonna be easier to rotate than if the mass is unequally balanced. Okay, so that's calculating moments of inertia point of a collection of point masses. The last thing I'm gonna do is a quick calculation of the moment of inertia of a continuous mass moment of inertia of this continuous mass, let's just take a meter stick. And let's just pretend it's a one-dimensional stick. Don't worry about the fact that it's actually three-dimensional. Um, and so my meter stick is, right, this is my meter stick. And I want to find the moment of inertia. How, what's the measure of how hard it is to rotate about, and I'm going to say about its end, pivot about the end. So here's my pivot point at the end. What's the moment of inertia about the end? And I'll, I'll challenge you to figure out what the moment of inertia is about its center um, after I'm done. Okay, so let's just say that the meter stick is a length L, right? We know meter sticks are one meter long, but anyway, we'll just call it the length L and mass M. The moment of inertia of a continuous collection of point masses, right, of a continuous mass is by definition the sum of MR squared, which is an integral of dMR squared if we make the M's small enough. We're gonna break the meter stick. We've done this kind of thing before. I have one of them there, but we're just gonna break the meter stick into little dm's. And if we make those little dm's infinitesimally small, that's where we get the integral from. And we're gonna sum up each of these dm's. So let me, I have one, of, one drawn in black there, but let me look at another one, right? Let's look at this dm right here, right? We can say there's a dm and it's got an r, which is a different r, right? The r's are different. I don't put a subscript on the r, but the r's are different. So we got to add up each of those dm's, multiply it by its own r squared, and add it up from one end of the meter stick to the other end of the meter stick, right? So we got to add them up, add up all the mr, sorry, add up all the dm r squareds as we go along the meter stick. I'm making this really messy. Let me take away some of these scribbles. Okay. So how do we do it? We do it in the exact same method that we did center of mass calculations. Right, let's look at a little dm. I just pulled out the little dm here, and I won't write dm, but that's the little dm, and I say, hey, let's just call it, because r is the length from our axis of rotation, and the dm is a tiny bit bigger, so it goes dr, right? So it's an additional amount r, an additional amount dr to r, right? So it's a width of dr. And so that means that the and here's, remember, this is the important thing that always comes up in these, is that the density, as long as the density is constant along the stick, the density dm dr, that's a linear density, mass over length, the density of the little piece must be the same as the density of the whole stick. dm dr equals m over l. The density of the whole stick is the density of a little piece. And why do we do that? We do that because this integral, going back to the integral, is an integral over mass, but the variable here is r. We've got to find a relationship between dm and r. And the boxes down here is what tells us, is that if we take these things in boxes, we can solve for dm. dm is m over l dr. So there, we just made a substitution for dm in terms of r. Because m and l are just constants. They're just constants, the mass of the meter stick and the length of the meter stick. So I do that on this page, right? Actually, let me, sorry, skip that. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this substitution into the integral. And imagine what you have is an integral of m over l, which is the constant, r squared dr. And we're adding up all of those from the left end to the right end. So we added up if our axis is at the left end, right? This was, let's just say r equals zero. And then when we go all the way to the right end, that's r equals l. So the limits are going to be, let me put the limits into this integral here. Let me erase some of this messiness. The limits are going to be from, in this case, are going to be from 0 to l. We're integrating the radius from 0 to l. Okay, so let's go to this. So here's, here's where, we, where we do that, is that the moment of inertia, we make the substitution for dm. 
and we put the limits of 0 to L. M over L comes out front, and so we've got the integral of R squared dr. The integral of R squared dr is R cubed over 3, if you know how to do simple integrals. And the limits are 0 to L, and we just plug in the limit, and what do we get? We get that the moment of inertia of a meter stick is 1 third ML squared. The moment of inertia of a stick of length L and mass M is 1 third ML squared. And then I just want to challenge you to think, hey, what would you change if I wanted to know what the moment of inertia is about its middle, right? We just found its moment of inertia, how hard it is to rotate it about its end. It's going to be easier to rotate it about its middle, so what would you change in this calculation, right? So what would you change? What would you do in order to, in order to figure out the moment of inertia about the middle? Well, the, the, the integral doesn't change, right? What changes is the limits. I'm not going from 0 to L anymore because 0 is now in the middle. So I would have to go from minus L over to, uh, sorry, it's a radius. I would go from, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, 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 minus L over 2 to L over 2. I go from minus L over 2 to L over 2, my limits change, and what that's going to do is go ahead and plug that in, try to try that, right, put a L over 2 to minus L over 2. Um, and what you'll find is that this constant changes. By the way, all of your moments of inertia are always going to be a mass times a distance squared. It's just the constant out front that's different. It's always going to be a mass times a distance squared and that constant out front, right? So, for example, a point mass is mr squared. A wheel is one-half mr squared about its center. A stick around its end is one-third ml squared. Um, a rim, like a, a bicycle wheel, is going to be... Actually, it's going to be mr squared. Uh, a, a sphere is like, I don't know, four-fifths mr squared. I don't know. But, you know, there's, there's all these constants out front are always different. Okay. So there you go. Moment of inertia. That's that. That's everything. We're done. No more video lectures. I hope you enjoyed uh, your last video lecture. I'm sure you were enthralled. Stayed awake. Dylan, I hope you did stay awake. Okay, so silver and gold walk into a bar. The bartender says, hey, you, get out of here. The gold leaves the bar. Do you get it? Hey, you, or a hey, you, get out of here. Uh, gold. All right, well, anyway, yeah. I never said the jokes were good.